Well, Dr. Owens, thank you again for being here. I really appreciate your time and your amazing book. Uh, it really had an impact on how I see the past. And thank you again for being here. Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. I would love to know first off, and before we dive into the book, I would love to know where the idea for this book came from. Yeah, well, this book came out of my dissertation, my um, PhD dissertation. When I was a graduate student, I knew that I wanted to work on black sexuality, um, but I was trained in an interdisciplinary department. I'm trained in African-American studies and history was the discipline that I kind of focused on, but I was trained in this interdisciplinary field. And so I came in with questions that were historical, but also contemporary. And in the first couple of years of doing coursework and beginning to kind of dig into archives and settling on history as like, okay, this is the method that I'm going to use to try to primarily answer my questions. I kind of went back and back and back in time through advice from various advisors and colleagues that kind of pushed me toward um, New Orleans as a place, because that's a place where a lot of the historical documents are available for thinking about sexuality and the history of slavery in a way that they weren't in other, they're not in other places. Um, and so that kind of drove me to New Orleans. And then I was really interested in the history of Storyville, which is a legal sex district in New Orleans um, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. There's like a 20 year period where it was legal. So I was reading a lot about that and thinking, okay, I'm going to write a dissertation about Storyville. Like, this is really interesting what's happening here in terms of various women across racial lines who are participating in sexual labor. And as I was trying to dig into those archives, I realized, you know, in order to understand this, I think I need to go further back in time. And that was also at the same time as I was beginning to understand New Orleans as the kind of hub of the antebellum U.S. slave trade. Um, it was the most important slave trading center in the United States during the antebellum period. And so um, thinking about slavery and thinking about New Orleans at the same time makes a lot of sense. Um, so that kind of brought me back and back and back. And then I was kind of in antebellum New Orleans thinking about these questions about race and sexuality. And then I turned to the law as one of the sources that I wanted to look at, mostly because it was accessible. There's a lot of legal material that's available online. And as a graduate student, it was easy to get. And I stumbled over a legal code um, in the Louisiana Black Code, which was written in 1807. Um, sorry, written in 1806, published in 1807. Uh, and, um, and that code, uh, made it explicit that rape was a category that would apply to white women and not to black women. And so that really got my attention. And that's kind of when the book started, I think, was sort of finding that statute and saying like, oh, I want to understand this better. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then, you know, <laughs> here we are many, many, many years later. But that was kind of, that was the kind of seed from which this project emerged. It's amazing how when you're a historian, that one little seed gets planted in your brain and sometimes you lose sleep over it and you go, I, I have to understand why this happened. Yeah. And, and it turned into a book. <laughs> it did. And I think for me, that statue, you know, I write about that statue in my book um, mm -hmm. extensively, but I think it was an interesting thing because basically the statute says that um, it's in the black code. So it's addressing, um, people of color of various statuses. Um, but basically the statute that lawmakers wrote said that if any person of color were to um, commit or attempt to commit rape on the body of, and I quote here, any white woman or girl, that person shall suffer death. And so that was really interesting to me because as a historian of African-American women's history and as a kind of student of black feminist theory, I understood that sexual violence was everywhere for enslaved women in the history of US slavery, that that was a core part of how slavery functioned. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had never really seen it expressed in the law in just that way in which they were explicitly excluded from the ability to be counted as people who experience sexual violence. And so I it began, it really kind of piqued my curiosity because it's a space where the law is saying something that kind of mirrors what's happening in reality, but kind of um, is exactly, is sort of like the opposite of that thing, kind of contradicts it. So I wanted to understand how is it that as African-American women's history historians, we are constantly using that phrase 
black women were raped in slavery. How do we understand that alongside this legal procedural reality, which was that that category didn't apply to them. And that really was the kind of tension point that got my, piqued my interest. Mm -hmm. You had a amazing line in the beginning of your book, I think it was on page seven, where you said archival research and storytelling in black feminist history might be better understood as a set of vigils that require patience, openness, courage, and rigor in the face of the weight of violence. What was it like after you found that little seed in that nugget of history? What was it like emotionally sometimes to research this kind of work? You know, I think that reading the law is interesting because it's so dry. Mm -hmm. um, it's very emotionally flat. That's part of actually, I think, how violence operates through the legal codes of the antebellum South is it makes it seem like there's not violence happening at all. The energy is very neutral. And so in that way, that's kind of chilling um, to work through those kinds of statutes and doc like that legal doctrine, but it's not, it doesn't always like emotionally stir you. In fact, that's part of, that's part of how it works. So in that way, I think reading the law, I was just like, gosh, I'm really lucky as a historian that there's so much here. And so I was just kind of eating it up. I think that the other major source base for my study um, are legal cases. So there's legal doctrine, which is sort of the stuff that legislatures produce, right? These like big books of laws. And then there's court documents, which are much more granular. They're the story, they're, they're testimony and um, other kinds of like procedural information that tells you a lot about individual people's lives. Because people come to court when something's gone wrong and um, they're trying to adjudicate that. Um, and so there's a lot of little granular detail in those kinds of spaces. And that stuff was hard. Um, there were some cases that I worked through and I was like, oh, I really, I could, I could see, I could feel the energy of an enslaved woman who was just like really scrappy and was like, I'm going to use the law even though I'm not really supposed to, I'm going to use this little corner of the law that's available to me and I'm going to be super inventive and strategic. And that, you know, I really loved reading those cases, even though they're all laced with violence. I really got the sense of these women who were survivors. And then there were other cases that I really struggled with. Um, the case that sort of occupies the first chapter of my book, a story of Delphine, who's a little girl who, um, who's a refugee from the Haitian revolution, um, is a case that I picked up and put down many, many times over the years before actually being able to write about it. It just bothered me. It was a really, it was really hard for me to write that story. And it was really hard for me to sort of sit with sit with her story in part because it was really complicated, but also the way that she talked about violence um, that was done to her and done to her children uh, was really upsetting and was really hard to sort of sit with. Mm -hmm. What was life like in New Orleans in the antebellum period? What, what did it look like and what was it like for those who were enslaved persons in the, in that sphere at that time? So there's lots of, really good writing on this question. Um, and I drew really heavily on the historiography as well as on new research that I did. Um, I think that the defining characteristic from my perspective of New Orleans in the antebellum period was slavery and slave holding and slave buying and selling. Um, it was everywhere. And I think that New Orleans is really interesting when you sort of like close your eyes and try to transport yourself back into the antebellum period. What you want to imagine is that enslaved people are not like all huddled together in one place being bought and sold in like a big rotunda, which is I think sometimes the the popular imaginary of what slave sales are like. And it's like this big extravagant affair that did happen in New Orleans. There was kind of one central hub of of um, of of auctioning of enslaved people and other and other goods, art and uh cotton and stuff like that, um, commodities. But the main feature that you would notice if you were transported and plopped down into antebellum New Orleans right now is that there were enslaved people lining the streets everywhere. Um, that there were areas where that slave trading was more dense and areas where it was less dense. But if you were to sort of like walk around the French Quarter, you would see enslaved people standing outside of slave yards behind buildings that you know, 
were inns where slave traders were coming and staying for a couple of nights while they sold the people who they um, had in their coffle at that time. Um, you would see enslaved people being sold, you know, in the back room of a cigar shop or a hat shop. So it's just like totally suffused into the whole city. And the other thing that I think is really important to my sort of orientation and perspective on the city is that it was a place where sex was being sold to. And so one of the things that I do in my book is I try to map out in the old city, which we now think of as the French Quarter. That's like where most of the action was, it's a kind of downtown area in the antebellum period. A lot of the rest of what becomes New Orleans as a city later was more rural or sort of suburban. Um, anyway, in the French Quarter, there are areas of dense slave trading that's kind of dispersed and areas where it's more dense and less dense, but it's kind of dispersed. And similarly, there's areas of dense sex trade, so brothels. Um, and again, more and less dispersed, but it's kind of everywhere. Um, and so I think that sense of everything is for sale, which is what um, a scholar named Joseph Roach says, is really present in that space. The other really important characteristic element of antebellum New Orleans is that it's a really, it's a polyglot city. It's a place where people are speaking different languages, where people are coming and going all the time. It's a place where free people of color are living, working um, alongside enslaved people. Um, there are white immigrants who are not big fancy slave traders or like huge planters, but kind of middling white people who are trades people, who are sailors, who are participating in various other kinds of markets. Um, and so it's a really complicated place, I think, um, culturally, linguistically, there's a lot going on. It's like a bustling big city um, and people are coming and going all the time. And so it's, I think, a really dynamic place that as historians, we continue to find more to say about. Mm -hmm. It really shows uh, when when I was growing up and learning about enslavement in America and chattel slavery and such, you automatically start to think of the, the auctions and and and, and the, the what we would call auction houses almost a way or an auction block, and we say yeah. that's where it would have happened. A lot of us never even considered the idea that this uh, that these persons are being bought and sold, like you say, in the back of a shop or somewhere else, and saying you know as the as a commodity a lot of people don't realize that they think it's a centralized kind of thing instead of something that happened everywhere yeah yeah i mean i think that's one of the things that's so interesting to me um about the violence of slavery and slaveholding in general in the south and that's really well expressed by the kind of markets that existed in new orleans which is that i think that the like the common narrative or like public narrative that we tell ourselves in the United States about slavery is that it was like this thing that happened over there. Like whether that's Northerners saying that about the South or even just us as kind of contemporary people, regardless of what your location or affiliation is, looking at slavery and saying like, well, everything was kind of normal except in the auction block area, that was really bad news. Or like, you know, in the plantation, that was really bad news. And I think that, what I see in my archive is um, that enslaved people were everywhere. <laughs> Slavery was everywhere. Slave holding was everywhere. And even the people in Northern places like Rhode Island who were not themselves by the middle of the antebellum period directly owning enslaved people were imbricated in the process. They were participating in an economy that enslaved people, even if it was kind of like uh, essentially offshore, right? Um, and that people who were living in New Orleans would be touched by slavery and slaveholding regardless of their status and regardless of their relationship to that particular um, sort of way of being. And so it's really important to me to get across that it's not just spectacular. It's not just like the auction block, which we can kind of mm -hmm. locate and look at and say like, wow, that's really extreme, but it's actually part of everyday life. And that's a big mm -hmm. part of what I'm trying to get across in this book. Yeah. So you do a fantastic job of that because I think far too often we think of the, the Hollywood scene, the shots of, yeah. of, this is what would have happened when it's just they were trying to get the shot instead of what it was actually what it would have actually been about and how it really permeated a lot of different places mm -hmm. in, in America. Yeah. Uh, you you teach classes on uh, slavery in America, history of sexuality, women's history, yeah. and more. And uh, 
one of your classes discusses consent and obviously consent is in the title of the book. So uh, we have to, we have to talk about this word that we still have to debate with some people about today about <laughs> consent. So, sadly, it's, it's the world we're still living in in some ways. Uh, what did this consent look like at this period in the antebellum period in New Orleans with enslaved women? So what I'm trying to do in this book is to expose what I think is a kind of ideologically lovely idea that if you say yes, or if you say no, it matters. Um, and expose that that's actually in practice a really fragile thing. So in terms of your question, like what did this consent look like for enslaved women? What I am really working on here is trying to understand how enslaved women were not legally understood as people who could give or withhold consent. Legally, they were not people who could testify in court. They were not people whose voice was understood in the law to matter. And so when somebody engaged in sex with an enslaved woman, that person was not obligated legally to ask, listen to, or care about what she thought about it because she didn't own her own body. At the same time, in my book, I focus on women who were involved in sexual labor, which means that they were having, they were in, involved in contract in in um in transactions all the time. So they were, they were working in brothels or they were concubines. They were in some kind of long term sexual contact with a white guy, um, usually somebody who owned them or had formerly owned them. And in those scenarios, what I find is that despite the legal absence of their consent. Like it's just nowhere. It doesn't exist in the law. If they had gone to court and said I was raped, literally there's no statute that would have made that matter, right? They mm -hmm. had no ability to say that. Mm -hmm. um, despite that, they're involved in all these transactions in which white men are asking for sex from them and at the same time threatening them. So will you have sex with me? And if you don't, I will kill you, right? Mm -hmm. That thing happens all the time. And so, uh, your question is sort of like, what did, what did consent mean for enslaved women? I think that enslaved women understood that consent was kind of an empty category. It was a nice idea. It was a fantasy um, that if you say, if you, if we decide that we're equal in a space, that we can just be equal in a space, that we can just kind of um, suspend the reality of power difference between people by saying, this is just an interpersonal interaction. Um, I think that they could see that that was just bollocks basically. Mm -hmm. And so, I think they found other ways to establish their own power um, in their bodies, but also in their sort of like pursuit of safety and security for themselves and their kids. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think basically like it's true. Consent remains a really tricky thing in the present. Something that I think we like to think we are all on the same page about, mm -hmm. or at least sort of like, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think we like we like to think that we're all on the same page about it, but uh, I actually think that most of the time there's a lot of dispute about what counts, what doesn't count, um, and I think that's not because women are shady or men aren't listening. I think that's because this idea is actually an ideal. It's not simple. Um, power between people is not simple, and uh, I think that the idea of sort of ask first is a really nice idea. And also it's a very functional idea in the context of the world that we live in. So I'm not actually tossing that out. But I think, you know, if we think about intimate partner violence in the present for like two seconds, it's pretty clear that it's really complicated and that the bonds of affection and violence are not necessarily disentangled from one another. Sometimes they are, but often they're not. And I think that we, when we hold up consent as this like clear thing that we can all get on board with and everybody knows it when we see it, um, we're kidding ourselves because I think, uh, I think we don't. And I think that often the fact that we're all sort of like 
engaging in that conversation as though it's clear means that women are constantly in a situation in which things weren't so clear. And the only thing that they can say is it was black and white. It was yes or no. And that's not actually reflective of their experiences. Mm -hmm. What I found striking in the book was that you said through all these court documents, you were finding uh, murders and larceny and all this stuff, but mm -hmm. rape is hardly mentioned, if at all, mm -hmm. in the documents. And some people, <clears throat> excuse me, some people would twist that and they'd say, well, it just didn't happen. Oh, and sure. it, yeah, you know, they, they would say, well, it, it didn't happen. None of this happened. But we as historians have to dive deeper into why is it not in there, correct? And say, yeah. we need to find out why rape isn't mentioned in this. And yeah. that was your mission. Yeah, that was my mission. Exactly. I mean, I, I, the, the documents that you're describing are these, um, basically like recordings of like, of petty crime that happened on the street. So duels and that included assault and murder and things like that, where people are kind of like brought into court or brought into this kind of like into jail and, um, arraigned and rape is not there. And, you know, as you say, one way to read that is that it wasn't happening. But we know as women's historians that it's definitely happening. That's not a question. And there's plenty of historiographic um, consensus around that. Um, and certainly for enslaved women, we know that sexual violence was endemic to their experience, in part because as historians like Jennifer Morgan have pro proved a long time ago, um, their reproductive capacity was so essential to the project of the Atlantic slave trade, but also, um, you know, not just because of the result of pregnancy from sexual contact, but also because of the narratives of formerly enslaved women, of women who self-emancipated, women like Harriet Jacobs, who tell us what's going on. They tell us that they're under threat. They tell us that that threat is sexual, and they tell us that it's terrifying and it's constant. And so we know that's there. And so then you go back to a document like these recorder's court documents, these minute books that tell us what's going on. And the question is, well, why isn't it there? It's not not there because it's not happening, but what are the other reasons it might not be there? And the conclusion that I come to is that it's not there because the people who are doing the writing, the people who are doing the recording, and the people who are coming to court uh, don't really care, don't really think it's a problem. So law is an interesting way to think about social life because the law is one space in which we make claims about what's okay and what's not okay in our social world. So we're kind of making a plan when we write laws or legislators are making a plan for what they want to see happen. They're regulating stuff that they want to see not happen and they're creating permissions for things that they think are okay. Um, I really like the framework that Laura Edwards uses about the peace. So like what constitutes a peaceable existence for early Americans and the way that they shape that peaceable existence is totally compatible with slavery. It's totally compatible with imperialism. It's totally compatible with um, domestic violence. It's totally compatible with all kinds of things that we don't currently think are appropriate. But at the time, that was all in bounds. And so when I'm looking at that document, I'm just saying like, oh, this is a really good description of what people in that time thought was out of bounds. But it doesn't mean that the behaviors that we know were happening then and that have been happening, you know, across time forever, including sexual violence, weren't happening. It just means that they didn't write it down because they weren't really that worried about it. The the idea of law and and the idea of freedom comes up with Delphine's story. And and I hear a lot more of my colleagues talking about the Haitian revolution and and the 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 turbulence and the turbulent time of that island uh, nation around that that era. Mm -hmm. And Delphine comes from that. And and I would really uh love to hear your insight on Delphine's journey mm -hmm. from Haiti to New Orleans and that idea of this is a whole different world now and a whole different life for her. And she's just one of the characters that people will see in this book. Yeah. So Delphine's story is in some ways um, like one reference point among many that historians have of this big tide of refugees who left in the middle of the Haitian revolution or sort of at various points, including mm -hmm. middle and toward the end when Delphine leaves, um, who end up, dispersing across the Atlantic world, but there's a pretty predictable pattern of kind of hopscotching from Haiti to Cuba 
and then to New Orleans. And then there's another group of people who go to Philadelphia. And so there's this real influx of um, Haitian emigres. And historians like Martha Jones and um, Rebecca Scott and Jean Hebrard have written about these journeys. And so Delphine is one of these kind of people. She's a woman who comes to court as an adult, but when she's fleeing the Haitian Revolution, she's a, she's a child, she's five. Um, she was born free on the island. Um, she was born free on the island because she had free parentage, but also because by the time she's leaving the island, slavery has been abolished. Nobody's a slave in Haiti. Um, and so her story exemplifies the kind of mixed up and really fragile legal landscape that Haitian emigres uh, of color experienced when they left Haiti. So nobody was enslaved in Haiti by the time Delphine was leaving because slavery was abolished. But a lot of people were enslaved in Cuba. In fact, slavery in Cuba was on the rise by the time she showed up there. Same thing is true in New Orleans. Um, so what I sort of, so that's kind of like the background basic sort of story of Delphine is like, how does she, this five-year-old kid who has no power, like she's five, right? She's not just, she's not just like a woman of color, a girl of color in the Atlantic Caribbean world. She's also just a kid, like, you know, and I think that vulnerability was what I wanted to kind of demonstrate in this chapter. Like, I'm just, I became very moved by what it meant that she was just like, she was being tossed around. But she's also being tossed around as this vulnerable little person in the co context of these like massive political changes that are happening around her. Slavery is being abolished or it's on the rise. Um, you know, Americans are taking over the Louisiana territory from the French, you know, so people like William Claiborne, the first governor of the territory is like really freaking out and saying like, what is slavery gonna look like in this place? And Delphine's just like a little girl showing up. She doesn't know, she doesn't know anything about this massive imperial change. She doesn't know about the age of revolutions. She's just a kid. And I think the question that I, I'm trying to work in that chapter and that her story I think helps us answer is, you know, how to think about these massive political changes, these kind of big scale issues at the level of the intimate. What it means to be a person whose life is actually determined by these massive things, but is as much also determined by the fact that she's a kid and she's attached to you know, various family members who die along the way. And suddenly she's in New Orleans in the hands of this white guy. And before you know it, she's a slave. How does a kid who's born free become a slave? Well. In a way, it's kind of happenstance. She happened to be born in the middle of the age of revolutions. She happened to be born um, to a family that had an attachment to this white guy who maybe had been great. I don't know. But by the time he's in New Orleans, he's saying like, okay, the pragmatic thing to do is to sell this kid and get on with my life. You know. So I think that that kind of just like vulnerability and fragility is what I'm trying to show in Delphine's story. Mm -hmm. And the and the court records go back to her story and and you see this ongoing legal kind of fight for yeah. what this person was free and now you're saying they're not and why is this so and mm -hmm. you almost see the the trials of the state coming into the union which way is it going to go and the governor's unsure which way it's going to go in this child's case. You yeah, know, and the five-year-old, and and the story is so uh, uh, heavy because it is a child. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's not someone who's like my age. It's a it's a five-year-old child. Yeah, yeah. I think that that the fact of I mean that story was hard to write for lots of reasons, but I think that becoming yeah. a parent really changed my ability to read that court file because for a, a long time I was trying to write this story and was thinking a lot about her adult life. Um, in which she is stationed as a concubine in the house of a rich doctor guy. And, um, and she is experiencing a lot of violence in that household. She comes to court and tries to get free. So that was the kind of crux of the story for me, but actually rebuilding her early life story became really important to me as I watched my own kids just like be utterly dependent on their family. And I think that that really put a different lens on it for me as I was looking at her story, like, Oh, I really want to tell this early part of her life because you know, she has no idea what's going on. And I think in a way, 
there is this kind of arc of from slavery to freedom that is a very, um, it's a very seductive narrative that is a very adult narrative that people in slavery in the United States uh, were fighting for freedom, that they were thinking about freedom, that they were ambitious about it, that they were running away, that they were like thinking about this long horizon that someday they would get free. And I think that the reality is that most, in, most people who were enslaved in the United States in the antebellum period were born and lived and died in slavery. And I think that Delphine happened to be a person who, as an adult, said, I'm going to try to get free, um, went to court to do that. But I think that the kind of the smallness of her world in the context of this really big set of changes was really important to me, not just on behalf of her story, but wanting to invite readers to think about enslaved people as having a whole lot of things going on other than thinking about from slavery to freedom. That like, if you're born in slavery, if you are a child in slavery, if you grow into an adult in slavery, your experience of that, um, I don't think is going to be necessarily that focused on freedom because there's no particular indication that that's coming. And so what are the other things that you're thinking about? Um, mm -hmm. And what are the other kind of strategies that you use to get through the day or the week to make sure that you're, you know, your family are taken care of to make sure that you have enough to eat, right? Like I, I'm really interested in, in that kind of tight frame on a single person's life or on a single community's life. Um, and certainly there were plenty of enslaved people and plenty of people who were enslaved and not enslaved who were fighting for the end of slavery during the antebellum period. Don't get me wrong on that. But um, there were also lots of people who were just trying to get through. And I think I'm really interested in those stories. We've heard a lot, any of us who have studied the mid 19th century uh, enslavement in America or the antebellum period, we've heard a lot about not only the buying and selling of a person, Mm -hmm. Also, the renting of a person, mm -hmm. uh, but this book really sheds light on uh, enslavers placing their uh, enslaved persons into brothels. Oh yeah, and mm -hmm. and and it was something that uh, a lot of people will maybe read for the first time, and uh, them being used in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, that must have been a huge industry in New Orleans. Is that correct? Yeah. So the sex industry is quite present in New Orleans. And actually because New Orleans had this legal sex district at the end of the 19th century after slavery, that drew, I think a lot of historians attention to like what's going on here. And so there's a lot of good historic, his, his, a lot of historians have done work on the history of the sex trade in New Orleans before me. So Alicia Long and Emily Landau and others sort of trace that. Um, so Alicia Long writes that, you know, at, at some point in, um, uh, the antebellum period, there are brothels basically in like most parts of the city. So the sex trade is just, it's thriving. Um, and that's in part because it's an, it's an Atlantic world port city. I mean, it's a place where sailors are coming and going in the 19th century. And so the presence of brothels in New Orleans is not unique at all. If you were looking at Bridgetown Barbados, or you were looking at New York City or Philadelphia, or you were looking at London, you know, like in any of these spaces, um, Cape Coast and Ghana, you know, these are spaces where sex is being sold in brothels and in other sorts of formats. I think that the history of enslaved women being stationed in brothels is an understudied one. And it's hard to get at, honestly. Um, it's not something that was written down on like slave sales. So when an act of sale was um, sort of finalized, there are some, or like if you look at a, a ledger of enslaved people in a, in a sale, you'll see information about those people. That's extremely scarce, but it's still helpful. So you might see their age, you'll see their gender. You sometimes will see information about their coloration um, because sometimes enslavers thought that was interesting. Um, and sometimes you'll see like field hand or housekeeper as a description of what they're up to. And if there's a skilled laborer, um, who's skilled in a trade, in a masculine trade, like um, blacksmithing, sometimes you'll see that on the information. But the skilled labor of women, so um, hairdressing and barbering, um, 
uh, midwifery and sort of medicinal care, um, uh, uh, like cookery and food, food, food work, um, culinary work and sex work usually all get kind of en encased in that category of housekeeper, which is interesting, like, hmm. or else they say nothing at all. Um, and so, oh, nursing and wet nursing. So anyway, right. Right. there, it's harder to see that in those kinds of records. And so, um, yeah, so I think that there's more work to be done on, on, the presence of enslaved women in brothels, but we know they were there. And the story that I write about is um, about a particular woman who was enslaved in a brothel, but I found a few cases where for one re reason or another, um, there those cases shed light on the fact that there are enslaved women who are working in brothels. There's also some law about those brothels. And that also tells us a little bit about who's there. Hmm. When we're talking cases about this with uh, either transactional sex or uh, sexual violence mm -hmm. towards enslaved persons. We obviously have to uh, think about who is seen uh, in what light based on their father, grandfather and such. We see this with Alexina Morrison uh, mm -hmm. with the idea of whiteness yeah. uh, and, and her case. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, obviously, we don't want to give everything away. We want people to read the book. But yeah. Uh, this is an interesting case because it's, it's um, to me, kind of the uh, the end of the equation, sort of when you have all this going on and then yeah. you have you have offspring who are coming down the line who may appear different or, or something to that effect different. I'm using that in quotes, mm -hmm. uh, that there's going to be some kind of repercussion or misunderstanding in that way. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Alexina Morrison's uh, story? Just. Sure. Uh, a small bit. I don't want to give it all away. <laughs> yeah, Alexina Morrison. I'm glad you asked about her. She's one of my favorite sort of yeah. characters in the yeah. book. Um, and as as with some of the other folks in the book, um, she's someone who others have written about. Um, I really like this case um, because it's so weird. <laughs> basically, <laughs> uh, there were actually it's not a totally isolated case. There were other incidents of um, enslaved women who sued for their freedom on the basis that they were white. That's not that anomalous of a claim. Um, but her case is really interesting. And the reason that other historians and I have written about her, so that's Walter Johnson and Ariella Gross have also written about Alexina Morrison's case, because there's a lot of material in that case. Um, there's, there's just a really long case record. It's really descriptive. So her story is interesting because she's born in Texas and she winds up in New Orleans through the th through the slave trade and she has blonde hair and blue eyes and everybody knows that and she comes to court um, after her sale she kind of like fairly quickly flees the person who bought her James White in New Orleans and um, she comes to court and says I'm too white to be a slave and so you know her case is really interesting and provocative because um, uh, she kind of calls the bluff on the slaveholding enterprise, right? So there's, by the middle of the 19th century, when she's bringing her case in the 1850s, there's an enormous amount of race science that is really making the argument that Black people and white people are fundamentally different. And so that science is happening through medical science and through ideas about diseases that Black people can get, that white people can't get, or vice versa. Um, it's also happening through like the notion of the blood quantum. So like you can measure how white someone is or how Black someone is, the kind of idea of the one drop rule, which really comes in vogue later, is nonetheless like it's in development. It's like really what 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 sort of medical and biological science is thinking about at this time is a sort of pro-slavery racial project. So uh, really trying to make a medical and scientific justification that enslaved people, black people ought to be enslaved because they are fundamentally physically, biologically different from white people. There are lots of arguments that happen over the entire, you know, 400 years of slaveholding in the Atlantic world um, that involve some, some sort of justification of people who are enslaving are fundamentally different from people who are not. But those justifications change over time and over context. And when in Alexina's time and place, what people are really focused on is the body and on the kind of biological difference between enslaved people and people of, and, um, and, and white people. And so Alexina is like a real problem for 
for not just this particular slaveholder who owns her, James White, but for the whole project of saying enslaved people are totally different from white people, black people are totally different from white people, because no one can tell if she's black or if she's white. No one can tell. And if she's white and she's enslaved, that's a huge problem for slave holders. They're saying, oh my God, we've accidentally enslaved a white girl. Like that's a huge deal. Right. On the other hand, the fact of her body, of having long blonde hair and blue eyes is a completely logical consequence of generations of sexual contact between slaveholders and enslaved women. And in fact, her kind of phenotype, the way that she looks is not all that uncommon in New Orleans, certainly, but in the South. And I think that, you know, there are scientists who, or doctors who get, who they don't get flown in, but they get um, interviewed for this case, who are coming from North Carolina, from uh, Philadelphia. You know, there are people who are far afield from New Orleans which suggests that this kind of question of the racially ambiguous body is not specific to this place and, and this sort of city and state, but it's something that people are grappling with across the country. And the fact of her body sort of like showing up and saying like, you guys got to free me because obviously look at me, I should be free, you know? That really throws a, throws a wrench in their system. Um, so I just, I love her story because she's so gutsy and, um, and I think she just, she's just like goes right in. The other thing that's really important to me in that story, um, is that she, I think demonstrates a set of like her, her body itself, but also the way that, um, people talk about her body demonstrates a set of like the production of a set of racial tropes that actually help slaveholders feel okay about enslaving white girls. Um, uh, and I say that, I say, I sort of think of Alexine as a white girl because I don't really care what her parentage is. I don't really care what her like biology is. And we all at this point sort of are past an idea that race is biological. So I don't really care about that. What I do care about is how she looks and the fact that she's enslaved and all of the people who come to court to say it's appropriate that she's enslaved even this, even though this is the way she looks. And so I'm interested in sort of working through how they know, how they convince themselves that that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Dr. Owens, I have to ask you this question before we sign off yeah, uh, sure. from, from our episode today. Uh, what is next for you? <laughs> for me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for that question. Yeah. I am working on a few things and I'm sort of thinking about where I'm going to settle for a while. I think after working on a really big project for a long time and being kind of like laser focused, I'm not totally ready to jump into like, what's this specific next singular project. Right. There are some kind of loose ends that I want to tie up from this book. So for example, I'm, um, I collected a lot of data about rape law that ended up in the book, but I'd like to make it more easily available sort of in a digital format. So I'm kind of exploring how I could do that. Cause I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in those laws that I don't think I'm going to do a lot of research on, but I think I'd like to make available for other researchers. So that's kind of one thing I'm thinking about. Um, I've begun to do some writing on the long of this idea of ordinary violence that I work through in the book um, and how that impacts ideas about value in Black life in general and in women's lives in general um, long beyond the 19th century. So I'm thinking about that stuff. Um, and then I've started a project um, about lesbian feminism that I'm really excited about and really takes me like to totally a different space. I promised myself after working on violence for many years that I would do something that felt a little bit more fun. So I'm working on a history of American feminism that focus on, focuses on lesbian feminism. So that's what I'm doing. That's fantastic. That is great. Well, uh, Dr. Emily Owens, thank you for, for coming on and talking with me today. And uh, we're going to put a link to all of your stuff in the chat or in the description. And uh, really, really wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for reading my book. I appreciate it.